Good morning, Lou Troopers. Mm. Coffee. Well, first off, thanks for all the nice comments about the uh, diorama video. And uh, some of you point out some things that I had already pointed out in some of the videos, but obviously uh, a lot of you guys are starting out. More than I'm getting more viewers, a lot of guys are starting to catch the boo-boos, um, particularly the place I forgot to put the green screen, and uh, chrome key out the green screen and the red screen. And uh, somebody asked me if uh, the little guy on the back of the truck was a joke or if I just left it on there or forgot about it. No, I, I put him on there on purpose at the very last scene when the trucks are leaving, that same guy that was clutching the back of the truck. I put him on the back of the truck again in the very last frame, just sort of as a last couple of frames as a uh, sort of a, a gag. Well, not really a gag, just sort of a, you know, a nod to the early part. Anyway, so what I really want to talk about today is uh, models of the space shuttle. And here's why. Uh, Rick sent me this book, Riding Rockets, which I just finished last night, uh, by Mike Mullane, and it is a really, really interesting read. It's funny, um, and uh, you realize not only are the astronauts human, but, uh, <laughs> well, as he says, they're from Planet Arrested Development, and I'll, I'll let you read about Planet AD, I'll let you read about that. But unfortunately, a lot of the, being, living in a native Floridian, having grown up with the Apollo program, and as you can tell I, I am definitely a huge fan of the space program although I'm mostly oriented towards uh, the earlier space program but uh, I had never actually built a model of the space shuttle if you can believe that and the reason for this is is kind of complicated but the, the kit of the space shuttle that always interests me the most was the one with the gantry and uh, given the train wreck I'm making out of the launch umbilical tower, and yes, I need to get cracking on that again, um, I, I, of course, it's a paper kit. I've never done a paper kit before, and, and, and I'm having some real issues getting it to look like it wasn't made by a third grader, and that might be an insult to third graders. But uh, I've always found the gantry systems and everything very complex, very interesting, and at least the one on the shuttles is made of styrene, to be honest. I don't mind admitting I'm kind of intimidated by that thing and uh, that, that's kind of a long-term project but anyway uh, that's the one that interested me most the reason the shuttle never really interested me as a modeling subject despite having been a huge supporter of the program at least initially uh, is because it uh, just seemed and I, this is probably gonna get me some hate but it just seems so vanilla I have made a couple of models that were kit bashes of single stage to orbit uh, uh, aircraft that were, um, man, one was kit bash from an F-102 and one was kit bash from an F-106, and they were sort of shuttle-esque looking, um, but uh, the shuttle itself, to me, there were so many toys up and everything available, and I did have some little dime store toy I, I'd bought the, uh, on the shelf for a while, but... I was never really that interested in building it, partly because it was still there. You ever notice how often you're not interested in building something that exists? You, you tend to want to build things that aren't around it, but that's me. A lot of us are a little more history oriented. Well, anyway, uh, the, uh, the point I was getting at is that having being from Florida and knowing a few people that have worked for the space program in various capacities, there have always been issues with uh, off and on with the management at uh, down at the Cape and at NASA and this book's going to get into that and believe me it's uh, it's quite a story uh, so also the, the orbiter and or the STS it literally did that it, it orbited so probably the same reason I ever built a model sky well Skylab turned into an embarrassment I hate to say that for the people that worked very hard on it but with the parts breaking off and that foil on it and everything and the shuttle did get us back into space after uh, you know, a relatively rough decade in the 70s. In fact, I actually did a video, which is on my channel, called uh, The 70s, A Decade That Changed America. That's a whole other conversation. But anyway, the shuttle got us back into space. And uh, at first, I was an enormous proponent of it. And I think, it, I'm glad they built it. It needed to exist. But when you, you, when you see the decision-making process, that which he talks about in here, that was... Uh, going through the management mines and everything, and, and even the astronauts, to be honest, it, it, it's, it's a little distressing. So 
the to me the space shuttle kind of represented both the good and the bad but um one thing about it though is don't forget it's still the most dangerous platform that ever went into space it, the, the the two shuttle disasters have killed uh, more astronauts than any other single space platform and of course they carry larger numbers I think the shuttle would have done better if they'd had the shuttle alongside of a, a BDR, Big Dumb Rocket, uh, manned system to go with it because you didn't need to be using the space shuttle for some of the things that we're using it for. And he gets to that in the book also. Um, but there were some things it was needed for. So uh, one thing I, I didn't realize, and if you're a modeler, this is something you may want to see you can get some information on. They were going to have an Air Force space shuttle that was going to fly out of Vandenberg. And actually, Mullane was slotted to be on the first flight. It, it never happened. I didn't realize the Air Force never, their command really didn't want the, uh, the shuttle program. Congress kind of shoved it down their throat. And he gets into that a little bit. And, uh, and that was evidence in the way the Air Force treated its astronauts versus the way the Navy treated its astronauts. And he will talk about that, too. It's good stuff. Good read. About 360 pages. Um, never got boring. But... The shuttle, you think, well, a supersonic manned aircraft is complicated, twice as complicated as anything else, and a rocket like the Saturn V or uh, Saturn 1B, that's complicated, and that's twice as complicated as anything else. So two times two, the shuttle must be four times as complicated, and you realize it's more like not, it's not two squared, it's two cubed. It's like 16 times as complicated. Without getting too technical, he gets into that. And I didn't realize how many close calls they'd had. They'd had uh, aborts to orbit. They'd had fires. They'd had all kinds of stuff. A lot of which nearly, uh, even when the shuttles he on had damaged tiles. And uh, that's a whole story. And it, it's, it, it, was, it was all closer run thing than, than, than we realized. And uh, that doesn't mean it is an incredible program. But getting back to models. Sorry, didn't mean to do a book report. But getting back to models, uh, the, the shuttle kind of looks like an airplane. So it, to me, it wasn't, I guess, as, an, as inspired with its relatively basic lines, it wasn't as inspiring as a, uh, as a modeling subject as other things, uh, which you could argue that, well, a, a rocket standing on a pad, just a tube with a cap on the end. And um, fair to say, to me, there was just something about a Mercury Redstone or a Gemini or an Apollo standing out there on the pad that was more enticing. And, and I think part of it might be because these rockets were exploratory. They were, they were all, every single rocket launch from, from Al Shepard to Apollo 17 was a, a mission of exploration. By the time you get into Skylab, Apollo Soyuz, and uh, the space shuttle, everything's in Earth orbit. They're not really going anywhere other than around the Earth. That doesn't mean I wouldn't go in a heartbeat. I mean, like every little kid, I want to be an astronaut. Um, but uh, somehow the shuttle just failed to inspire me in the same way. Now, I do want to build a model of it. Uh, I do intend to. Now, whether I'll build just a shuttle or the whole stack, I don't know. But... Uh, Getting back to what I was saying about the Vandenberg, though, shuttle was that, that the, sorry, Captain Tangent here, uh, the Vandenberg, or the Air Force shuttle, because it was going to do a polar orbit, doesn't get that extra thousand miles an hour from the rotation of Earth. Remember, Earth rotates a thousand miles an hour when you launch from the Cape going with the rotation of Earth, you get a free thousand miles an hour of velocity. You don't get that going out of Vandenberg, so that means that reduces your payload because you need more relative thrust. And the, to help with that, the air, the Thiokol was working on this super lightweight SRB, solid rocket booster. And uh, after Challenger, that project obviously died. If the big steel ones were blowing up or causing disasters, they weren't about to go with a lightweight one. That's part of what killed the, the Air Force uh, shuttle. And uh, if you could find some pictures of those lightweight uh, SRBs, you could possibly do an, an Air Force shuttle uh, with the lightweight SRBs. That would be an interesting project. So, who knows? Maybe, maybe, maybe if I do get a shuttle, maybe that's what I'll try and research and do. But I got so many models on the shelf right now. It, it, I've got a production line set up that I just I need to get back to. Now that the diorama's done, I can get back to some building. But <clears throat> I digress. So anyway, uh, great book. 
but uh, it, it only re kind of reminded me why I'd never really taken the time to build a model of the shuttle. It just didn't really inspire me as much as like Apollo and Mercury and Gemini did. Now that's me. That is no criticism of anyone who's uh, building shuttles. In fact, I, I want to build one. I want to build a couple of them. So I just wanted to point that out that as big of a space geek as I am, it's a little odd that I'd never built a shuttle. But this book did a good job of kind of encapsulating why. Uh, there was just a completely different atmosphere at NASA during the shuttle program than there was during the earlier programs. And it had gone from an organization that was breaking new ground and trying to, to, to you know, you know, beat the Russians to the moon and all these other incredible things to an organization that was basically just trying to survive, you know, keep its funding going. And, uh, but there is one thing that I thought was kind of cute. If you look at a picture, this is from the book of Mike as a kid, tell me he doesn't look just like Hogarth Hughes from the Iron Giant, you know, the Iron Giant. And uh, that was, I thought it was perfect. And of course he was into rocketry as a kid. So he, he, he and, and he was a, by the way, it should be noted, he was a mission specialist uh, and he was a backseater. And uh, I think he was the first Air Force backseater, a uh, weapon system operator, was a, to ever become an astronaut. So uh, that's no small accomplishment, but uh, if, if, you're, if you're interested at all in the shuttle program or space travel, I think riding rockets is a must read. And on another subject before I go, somebody had asked me about a gray card a while back because I mentioned took the gray card pictures. This is a gray card. And this is on a booklet by Canon about uh, digital color management guidebook. And uh, it's probably worth reading if you're, you know, into, into photography at all. But you use a gray card to, uh, if you're going to send like fine scale model, they say is a gray card image included and you put it beside your model, take a picture and then take the picture without it. And being that it's a, this card is a known value. Uh, there's also a color chart, which you can do that one also if you want to. But, uh, being that it is a known value, it gives a publisher a, a set piece to, uh, that they, they, they know exactly what that, that color is supposed to be so they can adjust the color entire picture to be correct. In fact, it says right here, the gray card was printed at a density of 18% using special ink. Use the gray card as a guide for setting the camera's white balance or for correcting the white balance after an image is taken. Due to the thinness of the paper used to print this guidebook, the card can be affected by the background and by the light. So you should place a thick white or gray cardboard behind the card when using it. And since I use the photo booth, it has a gray background. So that's taken care of. But uh, that's what a gray card is. So I just thought I'd point that out. And well, guys, that's it for this morning. Thanks for watching. You have a great day. We'll talk to you later. Uh, plan a live stream tomorrow at 3 o'clock Saturday, uh, East Coast time, 2000 Zulu. Again, 2 p.m. Central, 1 p.m. Uh, Mountain noon Pacific. And we will see you guys later. Model on.